Sins of a Soul Empire 2 has everything you'd expect from a Sins game, as well as a bunch of new features, bringing even more complexity and strategy to an already complex strategic game. Whether you're a new player or a returning veteran, there's a lot to manage as you build your own empire. So here are 21 tips to help you get started. And thank you to Stardock for sponsoring this video. Sins of a Soul Empire 2 is currently available on Epic and is coming to Steam this summer with a massive full feature content update. So if you're thinking something's missing like the Advent Faction, chances are it'll be included in the summer release update. If you'd like to wishlist the game, then use the link in the description. And now let's get into these tips. First of all, know your faction. On the build I'm playing, there's only two playable races with two factions each, but even so, they all play extremely differently to each other. The tech gain a unique trading mechanic that allows them to trade resources to balance their economy. The Vasari instead don't generally use credits outside of trading and build orbital structures to produce phase resonance, allowing them to upgrade different areas of their campaign. Both of these also have two faction choices for loyalists and rebels, and this changes some unique buildings, ships, and the capabilities of their Titan ships. Whoever you end up playing, make sure you familiarize yourself with their unique abilities and playstyle so you can better capitalize on their strengths. Next, you need to always remember that planets move. The system you're playing in is always moving just like a real solar system. Planets, moons, and asteroids will move throughout the map and this can connect them to new planets, opening up new routes to travel throughout the map. This can obviously be useful for you gaining a new way to get around, but it can also open up new routes for enemies to make their way into your empire. This can make it very difficult when prioritizing which systems to fortify, but there is a way to make it easier. By pressing the future orbit control button, you can view what will happen in the discovered map over the next hour, so you can more easily plan ahead. Not all areas of the map move exactly the same way as they're affected by different gravitational pulls. So you can use this to find areas that are safe to leave less fortified and rush infrastructure without worrying too much about invasion. For example, planets close to the star move faster than those further away. So the inner ring of planets may not be the safest for a long-term base as they can rapidly end up a lot closer to enemy territory. There are some outliers like asteroids that move rapidly around the edge of the map and can be used to transport your fleets deep into enemy territory. The bottom line is take a look at how everything is going to move and use this information to plan your next steps so that you're in the best possible position once everything gets moving. You can tell what direction every planet is moving in by these leading blue lines coming off them so at a glance you know where they're headed. This is a fairly new and possibly frustrating feature so if you don't want to use it it can be turned off which makes learning the game a whole lot easier. Speaking of planets moving, if you build all of your defenses on the side of the nearest hostile planet and it moves, they'll be able to get further into your territory before they take any damage. If you want to move your orbitals, you can use the Rotate Planets Orbital Structure button on the Advanced Actions tab to move them all at once and get them into position. Just know that while they're moving, they'll be non-functional, so doing this once enemies have arrived is a waste of time and will only reduce how much time your structures can spend dealing damage. On the upper left of the screen, you have your bookmark bar. From here, you can view any pinned planets, but more importantly, you can create and view fleets. Simply select a group of ships, create a new fleet from the bookmarks bar, and right click it to assign your selected ships, and boom, that's a fleet. Now, not only will you always be able to find them easily, you can also use fleet recruitment instead of just building ships from your planets and manually adding them to your fleets. You select the fleet and use the ship building menu to request ships for that fleet. This will send the build orders to the nearest available factories and automatically have them move to where the rest of the fleet is stationed as soon as possible. It's a great way to have more control of what you're recruiting and where they're going, and I'd highly advise using this for basically all recruitment. On a bonus tip for fleet management, select a fleet and hit control and a number to assign it to that control group. And whenever you hit that same number, you'll select that fleet and can double tap it to move your view to wherever it is, nice and quick. Each of the factions in game has access to a range of ships that each perform a specific job. Some are strong versus small ships, some counter missiles, some are better versus large capital ships, and some are strong versus planets. The bottom line is, no one ship is the best against everything, so building up your fleets with a variety of ships is the way to go to make sure you're ready for everything. With the exception of planet bombing ships, which you only really need later in the game and in smaller quantities, you can make your fleets with a mix of pretty much everything and you'll be in a good spot to take on anything enemies can throw at you. Even later in the game, stocking up on small corvettes and frigates won't be a bad idea, since they'll be better at taking on some targets than your large cruisers and capital ships. If you can get intel on what an enemy fleet is composed of, then you can try and build a fleet to counter it. But honestly, fleets aren't always changing and growing, so this will be nigh on impossible unless you're constantly sending out scouting ships to gather intel. Just fill them up with a good amount of everything, depending on what you have unlocked, and you should be fine. The combat game is all fully simulated, so when a ship fires a missile, it really is traveling towards its target and needs to hit to deal damage. You can even zoom all the way in and follow its trip if you really want. This also means that rockets and other weapons can be blocked or dodged depending on positioning. If you order your fleet to attack an enemy ship but it's hidden behind a station, they'll be hitting that station before they get close to their real target unless you make sure to get them a clear shot. Most of the time this is fine since you'll want to destroy everything the enemy has, but if you come across a key target like a Titan, make sure you get in a clear shot otherwise it may turn the tide out of your favour. When you have fleets made up of all different kinds of ships, chances are most of them have different movement speeds. 
When they're in the same planetary orbit, this isn't much of a problem, as your faster ships can simply move to their target faster and start dealing damage whilst the slow ones make their way over. However, when moving between planets, especially those you don't have vision over, it's sometimes a better idea to all move as one, so your faster, smaller ships aren't picked off the moment they land. This is where the movement mode of your fleet comes in. By right-clicking this button, you can order your fleets to move as one, and this will cause all of the ships to meet at the edge of the orbit before making the jump over to the next planet. I use this pretty much all the time unless I'm retreating or sending a fleet to help combat that's already in progress, since in both these cases, you just want to get units moving as fast as they can without worrying about moving together. Research in-game is separated into five tiers per type. Each tier unlocks you a bunch of new projects, but requires increasing amounts of research buildings to unlock. The more research buildings you have, faster you complete projects, so be sure to steadily increase your number as the game goes on, so you're never left waiting on a capacity increase when you need to be making progress. If you try and build something that requires research, it will just queue up the research needed to build it instead of locking it out until finished. If this is something quite complex that requires several research projects, then it will be very expensive, as everything will be queued up at once, and you can see a full breakdown of each step before you build, so you know what to expect. You can also manually select text to be researched and queue up pretty much as many as you can afford, so if you have a lot of resources, this can be a good option to put them to use and keep you moving forwards. Across the galaxies you inhabit, there'll be a number of different planet types, and to make the most of each of them, you'll need to complete various research projects. The initial projects will allow you to colonize the planets at all, and the follow-ups will allow you to utilize them more, with higher upgrades for their mining and commerce. If you can see a nearby planet that you're likely to occupy in the next few minutes, queue up the research needed to take it so that you're ready when you get there and don't have to spend time waiting around. Some planets you discover will have what's known as a derelict in their orbit. Once any inhabitants of the system have been cleared out, moving a capital ship close to these will allow you to capture them, rewarding you with XP for any capital ships in range, as well as random resources, so they're always worth picking up. Building up your planets and systems is a major component of the game and is really how you progress everything from your economy to research to culture. You can do this by selecting planets on the map and building each of their components from there. But doing this, you won't get a clear view of what your other planets are doing and if you're accidentally overbuilding one area of your game. However, if you head to the planet menu from the top of the screen, you can view all owned planets and manage pretty much everything about them. You can increase their mining levels, research tiers, planetary buildings, and even orbital structures alongside seeing each system's output of resources. This way is a lot faster since you don't need to zoom around the map to each planet and can see what structures are built where. Alongside their built-in abilities that are unlocked and upgraded as they level up, capital ships can also equip a number of items which grant them various abilities and bonuses. Some offer passive stat increases, whereas others have to be actively used, similar to abilities to provide an edge in combat. Some of those that are activated will be consumed when used, so be wary of setting them to auto use, and maybe save them when they are really needed to get the most value. In any case, make sure you're using these slots as they can raise the power of your ships and fleets and sometimes be the difference between victory and defeat. And all of these can also be managed in the fleet management menu from the top UI, so you can see what everything in your empire is using. This is a tip that goes for basically every game with resources, but if you have them, spend them. This isn't real life where you need to save for a rainy day. You want to pull those resources to use pretty much as soon as you earn them so you can keep progressing. Sure, later on saving a chunk large enough to rebuild a few fleets is okay, but early on you want to always be looking for something to spend your currency on. This goes for the three main currencies as well as fleet capacity. If you have room for more ships in your empire, then you better build them because you can bet your ass that your opponents will be doing just that and you don't want to be playing catch up when they come knocking. As you uncover more of the map, you'll come across several minor factions. Alternatively, you can spend influence to reveal any you can't find. These will inhabit single planets on the map and some, like the pirates, will be aggressive from the get-go, so are always worth keeping an eye on just in case they decide to go raiding. They can also be interacted with using influence points. These are earned over time by spreading your culture and your capacity for them is increased with research and buildings. You can then spend these influence points to raise their allegiance to you, which will unlock various items and abilities, which can be bought for more points to give you an edge one way or another. Raising your allegiance with one will make raising it with the others more expensive, so make sure you're happy with the bonuses before committing too hard to any of the options. Over the course of the game, these minor factions can also run auctions for various items and resources. If you spot one that would be useful to you, consider tossing a few influence points in to put in a bid, as if you win, you may be in a much better position than you would otherwise. Of course, most of your interactions with other factions in-game will be war-based, and unless you've set up some teams, you'll be at odds from day one. But that doesn't mean you don't also have the option for more. Diplomacy allows you to send other factions various offers, ranging from ceasefires for varying amounts of time to full-blown alliances. This can all be bought with various resources and even trading systems between empires. If you are swimming in resources but are about to face an attack that you're unlikely to win, consider paying them off for a while and giving you time to raise a suitable fleet so you're more prepared when the ceasefire eventually runs out. Exotic materials are the fourth resource in-game aside from credits, metal, and crystals, and are a little bit harder to come by. They're used for more advanced builds like late-game ships, 
buildings and space stations, and aren't harvested in the traditional sense. Instead, you can excavate each of your planets for a chance to find some of these resources, but this can only be done so many times per planet. The only way to reliably produce them is with exotic material orbital structures. These convert standard resources into exotics slowly over time, so provided you have the necessary resources, you can create as many as you want. Each structure can create one exotic material at a time, so creating multiple of these in your empire is the way to go to make sure you're never left wanting more. If you want to be really organized, you can even manually queue these up to be crafted so that you always have some waiting. At the moment, there's no way to automate this, so you will have to do it manually, but if you have a lot of spare resources and want something to burn them on, this is a good choice. If you explore the map enough, you should gain access to up to three trading markets. Once unlocked, you'll be able to view them from the trade markets button on the top of the screen and buy or sell metals and crystals and sell exotic materials in exchange for credits. This can be a great way to shift your economy to either get rid of excess of one type of material or purchase some that you're struggling to make otherwise. The pricing for these markets will vary depending on how much you buy and sell, so make sure you spread out your transactions to ensure you're getting the best price possible. Once the game gets going, it can feel pretty non-stop, but to start off with, you'll not really have a massive amount of things to do outside of starting slow expansion. If you're stuck in a quiet period, then don't be afraid to speed up the game to get through it faster. Equally, if things are hectic and you need more time to think, you can slow it right down or even pause to take all the time you need to make important decisions. These buttons are right at the top of the screen, or you can use the plus, minus, and backspace keys to save even more vital seconds. And lastly, if you want to know how you're doing compared to other players in the game, you can hover over your faction icon in the bottom left, and you'll see your rank for military, economy, and research. And those are my 21 beginner tips to help you get to grips with Sins of a Solar Empire 2 when it comes out later this year. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see some other Sins 2 videos like complete guides or faction deep dives. Like, subscribe, and if you want more space-based games, then check out this video where I find out if Darktide is good yet.